Primary Tourist, Chapter 30. A rose is a rose is mine. Aren't the loveliest words the loveliest things? On the day after primary day, 2012, at the point when finally I hit the wall, I started looking at my spike hooves and happened upon this poem. And I can think of nothing lovely, neither word nor thing. Now, looking back, there was so much loveliness right there in that room. The coffee, the barista, the weather outside, shit even being able to walk, but I was spoiled then. I couldn't think of a tragedy more complete than writer's block. Ding, ding, a text from Corina. Finished the great American novel yet? My writer's block was so bad, I didn't even know how to answer. Almost for today. Meanwhile, I scrolled through Politico's webpage and Real Clear Politics, and maybe a few other web pages. Romney was the big winner. Everybody agreed on that. What wasn't said was that Obama must have been licking his lips, not seeing a real worthy opponent in the field. Even more to the point, among Republicans, not Romney was almost as popular as not Obama. It was early still, but it was definitely starting to smell like four more years. Ding, ding, call me when you're ready. Okay, I texted back. I enjoyed my coffee, taking my time. I wasn't sure that I wanted to talk to Karina, but I didn't really see how I could avoid it. And I really couldn't see how I could avoid it as I saw her and her daughter walk into True Brew. Hey, she said. Hey, you, I said. I found myself, almost in spite of myself, glad to see her. And you, I said to Kara. Kara didn't even acknowledge my existence. Her mom, meanwhile, with an adult in the room, craved the adult company much more than her daughter's. And Kara blamed me for her frustration. I can't say I blame her. I crossed my fingers that what I'd get was the silent treatment. I could deal with that. How's the writing going? It's tough when you're looking for inspiration from Mitt Romney. Maybe you should look at Vermin Supreme instead. I never thought of that. You know, I got to admit, sir, I had it. Crazy, huh? Because let's face it, a hell of a lot more ink has been spent describing a certain Mormon ex-governor than a certain performance artist presidential candidate with a fucking boot on his head. Let's face it, sir. I'm not going to scoop anybody on Mitt Romney. His life, frankly, to his own chagrin, is an open book. Vermin? His life is at best a comic book. Maybe I could make it, I don't know, a graphic novel. But I'll tell you the truth, sir. Any thoughts along those lines were surrendered to ADD? I don't know. Maybe it was fear of success if I want to get all self-analytical and shit. Hey, would you or Kara like a hot chocolate or hot apple cider or tea or something? Hot chocolate, hot chocolate, hot chocolate was Kara's answer. What did I tell you about how you talk to adults? And about the magic word? Hot chocolate, please. That's better. Tea, please. I think I'll have hot apple cider myself. We all drank our drinks. Then I don't remember what we did. I do remember, though, that I tried to turn down the offer to give me a ride home, but it was a futile attempt. That, after all, was the point of meeting with me, really. Maybe not the whole point, but most of it. So we headed over to Rod and Erica's house. Rod was there, Erica was not. I kind of got the impression that that was A-OK -okay with Karina. Kara, on the other hand, 
would rather have preferred having Erica around, although she really liked Rod. I think she knew, though, on some level, that her mother would shut her out of interacting much with Rod. Rod, as they say, was sucking in all the oxygen from the room, even from me. Because what was tickling me was that Rod had a guitar in his hand and a fire was going. Damn, that was one blessing that I knew even then was a special thing, something not everybody had. And I've had it for three decades now. Holy shit, I'm getting old. The damn thing is, he was too, but he didn't look it. I knew he felt it, though. Even more than me. The fucking cruel trick God played on him was to mix intense pain with his greatest joys. Skiing, especially in the bitter cold, was almost as painful as it was exhilarating. The playing guitar killed his arthritis racked hands, especially on the trickier chord changes. But the sound so delighted him, and me, and Kara, and especially Corina. Sure beats living in an asylum. Howdy. You taking requests? Corina asked. Try me. I reached into my memory banks. Dunderback. Holy Jesus, that's going back. I don't think so, Spike. Rocky Top. And as soon as I said it, I wasn't in New Hampshire anymore. I was 3,000 miles and a ton of years away. Muir Woods, California. He was playing while we were on the road trip of our life. God, that was forever ago. Man, you're living in a different century. The prime of my life was in a different century. That's where I was wrong. The prime of life is right now, whenever now is. Unless you happen to be living in an asylum. Let me see if I can remember it. He gave it the old college try, but California was a long time ago. Sorry, man. It was just too many brain cells ago. Play something. Kara was getting impatient. Rod played some tunes every bit as old as my requests, but newer to him. I think there was more than one J.J. Kale tune in the mix. All of them were perfect. To tell you the truth, the only thing missing was weed. I had that in my pocket, but couldn't really indulge until Kara was gone. Erica came home. Kara was ecstatic. Karina was much less so. Not so coincidentally, shortly after, mother and daughter had to leave. And even less coincidentally, shortly after that, the weed came out of my pocket and into our lungs. And the music sounded even better. Another not coincidence. As Rod played, Erica and I chatted. You caught up with Karina, I see. She caught up with me as well, I like it. Sorry I couldn't keep her away. Oh, don't worry about it. I knew it would be tough. She can be a determined woman, not one without her charms. Do you want to sleep with her? Ah, the $60,000 question. Because truth is, sir, in lots of ways, the answer was yes, of course. She's beautiful, intelligent, I'm lonely, horny. What the fuck? Why not? But the other side of me knew, or at least was afraid that, the tough stuff happens after orgasm. Because it's not just my dick and her pussy that has sex, not if you're doing it right. I'll be honest, I didn't always do it right. And the reason I knew I didn't do it right was because after the visceral joy that an orgasm can be, I felt like shit right to the core, especially if somebody got hurt. And oddly enough, not necessarily me, because I'm not an asshole. Good means good for both, right? And remember, not so long ago, 
Sour fucked with my head big time. Both heads, when you think about it. And Karina is not necessarily the safest psyche to be naked with, if you follow me. So that question, do you want to sleep with her? Shit. It seems like it would be straightforward, but Jesus, has there ever been a more complicated question? I don't know. Isn't she fucking crazy? Remember, Spike, crazy is not good. That was Rod. He was between tombs. And remember, Rod, sometimes we are most attracted to what's not good for us. And by us, I mean me. That's what friends are for, to slap you on the head when you need it. But do you have to have such glee as you administer your duty? It must be my Protestant work that even before he finished speaking, his arthritic hands were strumming, finding the magic through the pain. Protestant work ethic indeed. Summertime dandelion wine. Yes. My old Kentucky home by Randy Newman. Man, that brought me back through the years. You know what I mean, sir? I've been hearing Rod play that song for quite a few years. But every now and then, I listen to the words. And I'll tell you, that Randy Newman was one twisted, cynical bastard. Sister Sue, she saw it and stout. She didn't grow up, she grew out. You never really answered my question. Do you want to sleep with her? Like the moth wants the flame. Mama says she's playing, but she's just being kind. Papa thinks she's pretty, but he's almost blind. Don't let her out, except at night. But I don't care, because I'm all right. We'd all joined in for the chorus. Oh, the sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. And the young folks roll on the floor. Oh, the sun shines bright on my old Kentucky home. Keep them hard times away from my door. That's it, isn't it, sir? Aren't all of us hoping to keep hard times away from our own door? Not our sisters, not our mothers or our father's door, our own. And some people, they think hard times are catchy. You know what I'm saying? Spend some time living in an asylum and you'll see what I mean. Nobody wants to walk a mile in my shoes lately. The shoes might be jinxed. The song continued. And here's where you can see what I mean by how twisted Randy Newman is. Brother Gene is big and mean. And he don't have much to say. Had a little woman that he whooped each day. Now she's going away. Got drunk last night, kicked mama down the stairs. But I'm all right, so I don't care. I mean, what's there to say about this? A sick, twisted, insightful mind came up with that. Then it was time for the last chorus. And before you knew it, we were all singing and hoping that those hard times would stay away from our door. That didn't really work out for me, did it? Not for now, anyway. That song's quite the appetizer, isn't it, Rod said. We all laughed. Maybe this shit I'm in now is some kind of cosmic justice for laughing at the misfortunes at the door of the old Kentucky home for everybody except the narrator. Soon, it was time for dinner. Soon enough, it was time for bed. Well, I can't say bed, really. Soon enough, it was time for couch, is more like it. And that was more than good enough for me. Funny, ain't it? Now I have a bed, and it's nowhere near good enough. I used to say if I had three squares a day and a roof over my head, I'd be all set. Well, I got that, and I'm not all set at all, not by a long shot. I never thought to say, and I don't live in an asylum. Who even goes there? Whoever thinks that your own life 
would be some kind of Twilight Zone episode. Poor guy, I used to say at the formula of every man's horror that every script followed. Who would have known that I was every man? Who wrote this fucking script? And who'll believe it? The damn thing, unlike a script, has no end. The grave, maybe? Christ, I hope not. Or at least there's a few stops in the road for three decades or so. You know what it is about this place? What's really horrific? It drains you of your dreams. Your aspirations become to survive until this place is a dim memory, a speck on the rearview mirror that you can forget ever was part of your life. So the only aspiration you're left with is escape. Escape to what? It doesn't seem to matter. It always mattered in the past. Escape to the written word. Escape to New Hampshire, to the land of the wannabes, after the wannabes moved on. Now, all that's left are the hills and mills and lakes and fucking mountains that you hope the wannabes even saw as they looked past at that big prize that was getting more and more elusive. John Huntsman escaped just barely. He definitely deserved a longer ride. John Edwards escaped twice. In 2004, he escaped all the way to the VP nomination, all the way to that deer and that set of blinding headlights. In 2008, he barely escaped, a weakish third when the top two really took all the oxygen in that room. What he didn't escape was the harsh light finally shined on him when the world knew what I could tell from the cheapest of the cheap seats at the Franco-American Center the Sunday before primary day in 08. Joe Biden has escaped New Hampshire time after time, never got the big prize, but got the movie prize twice. Oh yes, he escaped. Howard Dean, Newt Gingrich, Ron Paul, Jesus, all of them didn't escape. Not really. How about Spike? <laughs> How about that one, sir? Did Spike ever escape the land of the wannabes? Primary Tourist, Chapter 31. Time is on my side. The Rolling Stones sang it. And like a sucker, I believed it. What an idiot. Time is always, at best, neutral. And it sure doesn't stop for anybody. Now I know that. Right after primary day, 2012, time, time, time is on my side. Yes, it is. With apologies to Mick Jagger. If only ignorance was bliss, then I would have been one fucking blissful dude. January quickly developed its own habits. To tell you the truth, a lot of them were old habits moved suddenly to a post-primary New Hampshire, which was a different place altogether. Like other months, each day started with a sunrise, right around the time I woke up. And even more than most months, the wake was quickly followed by the bake. You see, sir, what I really was doing was trying to coax out the great white. To tell you the truth, most of the time I was up way before the sun. And the radio was tuned into Concord's NPR affiliate. And I was already baked and the stars still filled the sky. It's still nighttime, and my word processor was at the ready, just in case something would come to me, maybe a spike -oo or two, but nothing. As quickly as the spigot got turned on, it got turned off, cold turkey, and I wasn't ready for it. Oh, something would come to me somehow every day, but it was hard, and frankly, what did come didn't exactly always rock my world, to tell you the truth. Hello, January. 
And by the way, hello, son. He always came slowly, turning the treetops to amber. Erica usually came down the stairs before Rod, just about the time night turns into day. Good morning, we'd each say every morning during the work week, all through January. We'd comment on how beautiful or cold or both the day is or will be. Then we'd talk about something or nothing at all, and usually laughter would ensue, and sometimes wake up Rod, and then the hilarity would really ensue. We have been tickling each other since 1978. Some days he woke up a little later, and on those days, ah, hell, on all days, the dilemma of Karina was the number one topic of conversation. How else would we know it was January? Let me count the days in retrospect. Soon, there would be an aroma of coffee filling the house. Like Pavlov's mutts, my mouth would start watering. There's one more reason, as if I needed one, that it really sucks around here. The coffee around here really bites. But back then, coffee, isn't that something? One of life's great pleasures, if only I knew. Some days, right after the coffee, there would be pancakes, one pancake at a time. And I would figure out if I was staying home or needed a ride to town. It was my month off, January was. Every day off, just another day off. I could have been looking for work, but it would have been half-hearted. My job was in Providence. My life was in Providence. Jennifer was in Providence. And those three statements, my job is in Providence, my life is in Providence, Jennifer is in Providence, were more linked than really they should have been, logically. Funny how often logic don't mean shit in one's own life. My own life, anyway. Where was I? Oh, yes. Pancakes. Much better than the pancakes around here, I'll tell you that. But did I appreciate them? Don't get me started. So, after breakfast, more often than not, I headed downtown for more coffee, very good coffee. And wait, maybe today he'll show up, that damn great white. If not, what the hell, at least I'll have some good coffee. Lots of good coffee that January. Damn lot more coffee than great white sightings, that's for sure. You know what, though? I miss the whole routine. Even the empty staring at the computer screen. That was a real sweet January. In retrospect, at the time, I was getting really pissed at the fucking great white. Ain't that always the way? And you know, it's not like I didn't write at all. It's just that nothing that I wrote sang. You get my meaning? It was all flat. Just words. No magic. Most days I'd see Karina and Kara late morning, early afternoonish. Poor Kara. When it was just the three of us, her mother, craving adult company, paid her little attention. At some point, one way or another, we'd meet up with Rod. Poor Spike. Because when Rod was there, Karina paid attention only to Rod. And somehow it became my job to babysit Kara. And she could be, oh, how nicely can I put this? Well, let's just say demanding. She pretty much needed constant attention. And who do you think was expected to pay it? That's right. You're looking at him. Like I said, poor Spike. Now, some days I stayed in with Rod. And the weird thing about that was here we were, two of the best friends you've ever seen, together all day. And we probably said maybe 30 words to each other all day. And the weird thing was, we were both really cool with that. 
I never thought of myself as the strong silent type, but there you have it. The day I remember most was a day, like just about every day in January. I woke before either of them, and I saw that it was snowing, had been for some time. And also, like just about every day, I reached for my weed. With each hit, I could hear the quiet of the snow gently hitting the pavement that much more intently. I was in fucking heaven, what I imagine heaven was anyway. After about four or five hits, I reached for a shovel and headed for the driveway. Enough snow was falling so that it filled up the shovels, but not too much too quick so that I wasn't killing my back. Just keep shoveling, almost zen, you know what I'm saying? And I mean it about heaven being that way, just being a fucking shoveler in a random driveway, completely random driveway, except this particular driveway was home, shelter from the storm anyway, home for at least the duration of this one blizzard. Slush, the slush hit was the sound the snow made as it hit the ground. Scrape or a sound like that was the shovel hitting the ground, stopping a bunch of those slush, slush hits. But more's coming from the sky. You would think it would be hell, but it wasn't. It was heaven. I mean it. The damn thing is, it looks like the last time I had to, or do I mean had the opportunity to shovel snow? I mean, most likely, right, sir? Come to find out, Joni Mitchell was right after all, all those decades ago. Don't it always seem to go? That you don't know what you've got till it's gone. They pay paradise and put up a parking lot. That last part was just the cherry on the Sunday, but the early part about not knowing what you've got until it's gone. How the fuck did she know? I mean, at her age, you know? Rod got there right around the time I thought I was done. Not a bad start. That's your story, and you're sticking with it. Hey, ya. Uh, I could have gone in by all rights. I could have just said, I got the first shift. Enjoy. But to tell you the truth, I would have just been busting balls. Seeing Rod there gave me kind of a second wind, and all of a sudden, I wasn't ready to go in just yet. You got to extend the corners a bit. He pointed to the borders with his shovel. There. Through there. Hey, uh, I mimicked, then got down to work among the big fluffy snowflakes, among my friend. I think God himself was there too. Oh yeah, January was pretty special, sometimes, back then. Scrape, 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 scrape. Before you knew it, we were done. Wouldn't you know it? I always thought I'd shovel snow again. Ah, January. Where'd you go? What's that? Oh, true. It is January, isn't it? Not last January, though. That one's gone forever. The good news, though, is that I'm not Kara's adult of last resort. If you get what I mean. I never really preferred being around people that didn't prefer being with me, no matter how old they are. I may have been, been better than nothing, but Jesus, how sad is that? I'm a child's first diminished expectation. In January year one, Karina was on the brink of being a single parent and nowhere near the edge of getting with Rod as she thought she was. Or is it as she hoped she was? And Rod, when again will he have the love, no lust? No, more than that, whatever it was he had with her at half his age, more or less, when is that going to happen again? And remember, too, it was another January. And January is always something special to a skier, even when it was bitter cold. The night of January 14th, holy shit, man, it was fucking cold that night. I remember the date because the Pats were kicking Tebow's Broncos ass in Foxborough. And we were heading for the club 
where we spent the weekends that January, and we had to pee, me and Rod and Erica, and we stopped at a field with some bushes scattered about. Damn, it was cold, bitter cold, but it was beautiful. Such a clear night, each star so distinct, and we had just smoked, so there was that, too. I don't know if I ever remember being as cold, ever. And as beautiful as it was, I was cursing my stream for not flowing faster. Rod and I were going very close to the car. Erica had to go further into the bushes for privacy. God, it's so beautiful. If you say so, it's fucking cold as a witch's tit out here, Rod said. I didn't say much. Just had to get into the fucking car. It was so beautiful and it was so brutal. Both together, either alone seemed to miss the point. You get me, sir? Damn, what a January. Never one like it. Pretty fucking cold, though. That said it all, I thought. Weird thing about January. It knows the heights that only triumph can provide. It knows just how soul-sucking defeat at the highest level can be. Just how low you can and indeed you will go. Ask Mitt Romney. Depending on the year, he's seen them both. Technically, in 08, he wasn't gone until Super Tuesday. But the patient, as they say, was on life support, at least since Florida. Then, in 12, he built his winning run for the nomination on January results. He kept on winning, but no one seemed happy. John Kerry felt the triumph of January. Howard Dean, not so much. January, man, it's got it all. January, that's where it all starts. January, that's when some of it ends. It's like that field in the bitter cold. So beautiful, so brutal. Life here is like that except with just about none of the beauty. Just brutal. For no good reason. The new, not improved January. What's that? True, there'll be another January next year. You wouldn't have any idea where I'll be living then, would you? Heard anything? No, I didn't think so. So future Januaries are just a pig in a poke. Could be brutal, just like this. On the other hand, could be more beautiful than any January, than any month ever. I can't see that from here, but I couldn't see the asylum from there, if you get my meaning. Years a long time. Anything could happen. That's a great thing about the future. Possibilities are endless. The past and present, well, you're pretty much stuck with actualities, right? That and what ifs, that'll drive you crazy if you let them. But the future, all bets are off. Who knows? Some January in the future, I might just be taking a walk with, oh, I don't know, a regular cane. Not even a quad cane, never mind a wheelchair. Wouldn't that be fucking awesome? during a great blizzard. Either way, I can just be out of doors enough to be part of it again. Sure would be something, the future. Just wait and see. Last January, man, that was the shit. Everything was new. I could have had the world by its balls if only I could see it. Number one, over and above everything else, I was eating healthy. I know I can't go back or anything, but I got to admit, I wonder if I stayed on the mostly vegan lifestyle, hell, my heart might have stayed regular. My blood pressure might never have spiked. If only, if only. See what I mean, sir? I can't help myself. I just feel like, damn, can I get this tiny rewrite? One of these times I'm going to get it right. I had a new beginning in the Great North, if only I would have grabbed it. And why didn't I? Holding on to the present, I guess. 
or maybe it was the past, some past I never really had in the first place. At any rate, there's one future down the drain. My future these days is fucked. But January back then seemed like it would go on forever. Even the money was holding up. But I knew that either I needed a job up north or a place down south. So before you knew it, it was all going to turn into a pumpkin. The beautiful crazy woman was going to stay behind. The great white seemed to be escaping my clutches yet again. That tricky bastard. And New Hampshire itself was ebbing. Soon to be a part of my past. Could it be my future too? Never say never, they say. Right now, it seems like the longest of long shots, though. There still was some coffee to be drunk, of course. Karina was still around to talk to, to help her forget that she was pretty much a single mother now, which she didn't sign up for, no matter how much she sabotaged her marriage. And how about Kara? She didn't sign up for any of it. All she did was get born. Poor kid. But I couldn't do a thing for her, not if I had all February and March. Hell, if I had the whole fucking year and I played a million games of free sell with her, and shit, it seemed like I played nearly that many games anyway, I couldn't be her mother or even her father. And what she needed was one of them to show true love, not obligation. It's amazing how good kids are at telling the difference. Damn. January could be real fucking sad if you let it. Even sadder how quick it's going. Of course, though, then there's February. And even if it's the lowest little low, it's only 29 days on a leap year. In that particular February, everything was up in the air. I had a job to go back to on February 1st, if I wanted it, which I didn't. I much preferred being independently wealthy. Once again, time for plan B. What I didn't have is a place to go back to. Hello, Craigslist. Oh, yeah, and the Accelerators had their first gig the last day of January. Did I mention the Accelerators? Jennifer's new band? Anyway, I wanted to catch their first gig. I wanted to be back for that. A mistake. I'm doing it again, aren't I? I'm asking for do-overs again. No harm in asking, I guess, other than being a colossal waste of time. And that's one thing I don't need any help doing in this time suck asylum. No time to spend. Might as well waste it. So anyway, back to January 2012. We're getting real close to February 2012. Time, as they say, was slipping away. And remember, I didn't really have a home to go back to. But I had a bunch of shit to bring back to Rhode Island. And I might have been taking a couple of buses to get back. Ugh. Fun. Do you feel like visiting Rhode Island? I was half joking with Karina. When? Tomorrow. What time? I don't know, maybe around 10 in the morning. And lunch for you and Kara is on me at a great vegetarian restaurant. Make it 10.30. And there you have it. A big problem was becoming solvable. And where exactly are we going? That was kind of a tough question. I have an address or two. Thanks, Craigslist. Funny, though. There's a lot less fun actually to get an apartment this time around than to dream about places I never even saw four years ago. Dreams, man. Boy, are they the shit. Reality all too often comes way far short. My days in New Hampshire were numbered. I thought I knew that, kind of. To really know, I had to wait until October. Time's up? Don't I know it.